We'll be focusing on the question of globalization um, and um, utilizing uh, the insights of a um, Jesuit theologian by the name of Bernard Lonergan to help us think about um, the problems and prospects of globalization. Um, in order to introduce uh, the speaker for this afternoon, uh, I would like to introduce you um, to Monsignor Richard Liddy, who is a professor in the religion department and also a professor in Catholic studies. Um, and he is one of the leading scholars of Lonergan um, and um, has enormous amounts of insight into Lonergan. So if, if after this talk, in addition to globalization, you have interest in Lonergan, I uh, strongly encourage you to seek out this gentleman right here who will stand up here and introduce um, our speaker. So um, let's get the show on the road. So Monsignor Liddy, if you can come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, AC. So I was thinking about um, the parable of the seeds that falls on different grounds. And uh, Jesus talked about um, some of the seed falls on ground and it's, it, it's choked right immediately. And some seed falls on some very thin pieces of, of land and it comes up, but it doesn't have much root. And some is, falls among the thorns, and it's choked. But some seed falls on good ground, and it bears fruit 50 and 100 fold. So what we're hoping is that you hear the word. The word is like a seed that takes root deep in people's hearts. And that's what we hope from these talks, this talk today, and uh, the talk by Professor Paul St. Amour from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, and the response by uh, Professor Michael Stebbins. Uh, he's the Toth Lonergan Chair this year at Seton Hall. So um, that's my hope, that um, you hear a word, you hear something that touches you deeply, and that it bears fruit in your life. Uh, you hear a lot of words at the university, but we hope that you hear the word, the word that speaks to your heart and to your mind. So I'm very happy to present our lecturer today, Paul St. Amour. He received his undergraduate and master's in philosophy at Boston College and his PhD from Fordham University. He told me today that he worked with uh, people with visual disabilities for five years while he was doing his master's and his doctoral degree at Fordham. He's currently an associate professor of philosophy at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. His scholarly interests include the philosophy of religion, ethics, and philosophy of economics. Recent, his recent research has focused on Bernard Lonergan's macroeconomic theory. His articles appear in the Thomist, International Institute for Hermeneutics, the Lonergan Review, Theo Forum, Contemporary Philosophy, and the Proceedings of the American Catholic Philosophical Association. So after he speaks, uh, we'll, I'll introduce uh, the respondent, Professor Michael Stebbins, but I'm happy to introduce Professor Paul St. Amour, who got a, his, he got a flat tire on the way here from Philadelphia today. So we went out and, and found, a flat, found a good tire. Anyway, I'm very happy to introduce Professor St. Amour. Thank you, Dick, for the invitation uh, to be here with you all and uh, for your kindness in helping me get a new tire. You don't get that at most conferences. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm here today to think about globalization. Um, and uh, it's a complex thing, right? And so my paper is fairly technical. Um, and I, I don't know if I should apologize for that. Um, sometimes complex 
realities require us to think in a, in a very careful, serious way. And so um, the title here is, it, it's called a heuristic for the critical analysis of globalization. A heuristic is a way of, of finding the right questions. Um, so if you think in algebra that, that x, that variable x, you don't know what x is. But if you have the x, you can solve the equation because you have a heuristic. You know how to get to the answer because you can ask the right question in the right kind of way. So the, 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 um, the challenge here then is with something as complex and complicated and important as globalization, how do we think about it? Because um, 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 according to um, Joseph Stiglitz, um, who wrote a book called Globalization and Its Discontents, things have not gone well. Um, we might think they've gone well, but that might be a function of where we live and the outcome um, for us. Um, if you live somewhere else in the world, things might be quite different. Right? So we're here today to, 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 to try to think about this very important thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, just dig in here and uh, see how it goes. It's fairly long as well, uh, 45 minutes. If you have to leave or stretch your legs or something, I won't be offended. Um, do whatever you need to do to, to stay conscious. <laughs> in Globalization and Its Discontents Revisited, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz argues that globalization has fallen short of its initial promises. While from the outset, most economists recognized there would be both winners and losers accompanying the global expansion of commerce and finance, promoters of globalization tended to be overly optimistic that globalization would improve the lives of all. Benefits were highlighted while costs were ignored. And it was not made sufficiently clear that the benefits would accrue disproportionately to owners and upper management of multinational corporations. While globalization has undeniably raised the standard of living in some regions, most notably in Asia, the poor in many parts of the developing world find themselves no better off. More recently, discontent has spread to developed nations as well which are currently undergoing a wave of anti-globalization sentiment, some of which has found political expression in a resurgence of right-wing nationalism. Quoting Stiglitz, for millions of people, globalization has not worked. Many have actually been made, made worse off as they have seen their jobs destroyed and their lives become more insecure. They have felt increasingly powerless against forces beyond their control. They have seen their democracies undermined, their cultures eroded. While Stiglitz does not advocate blanket withdrawal from, from globalization, he argues meaningful reform must acknowledge globalization has been mismanaged and deep-seated problems remain to be addressed. The following are just a few he elucidates. One, trade negotiations have effectively advanced the interests of multinational corporations and the global financial industry, but have procedurally excluded significant stakeholders, including developing nations, the poor, advocates for the environment, and workers globally. Two, there has been a history of ill-fated foreign investment in developing countries, in which resolution focused excessively on repayment of Western creditors and was achieved by compromising national sovereignty undermining democratic process and imposition of austerity programs. Three, mobility of capital and corporate access to international labor markets has generated relentless competitive pressures tending toward minimization of wages, regulation, and corporate taxation. As governments compete to attract foreign investment, workers globally feel their jobs threatened by foreign workers willing to work for less. This well-documented well race to the bottom is detrimental in many ways. Lower incomes and weaker job protections negatively impact the lives of workers and their families and also drags on consumer demand. A weakening of the tax base threatens governmental capacity to provide public goods 
and sustain social welfare. Deregulation potentially threatens everything from environmental sustainability to worker safety to financial stability. Four, in some regions, globalization has induced job destruction in excess of job creation, i.e. higher unemployment. And five, globalization has been accompanied by higher income and wealth inequality. So the challenge then, if Stiglitz is, is, is correct um, in his assessment of, of the outcomes of globalization and how it hasn't turned out as initially promised, the challenge then, is, as I see it, is the challenge of uh, humanizing globalization. The next section is the challenge of humanizing globalization. Acknowledgement of the failures of globalization has, as it has been practiced in recent decades, if accompanied by a countervailing appreciation for globalization's potential benefits, if practiced more wisely going forward, gives rise to a question. How might globalization be reformed, reoriented in a progressive manner, or humanized? The question intends more than improvement in the economic good of order. Properly economic goods, such as income growth, maintenance of full employment, financial and monetary stability, sustainable public financing, balanced trade, etc., these are all important, not least because they underpinned, underpin material conditions for recurring vital, social, cultural, personal, and religious goods. But we might but might we also hold expectations for globalization that extend beyond purely economic considerations and critically analyze globalization in light of these ulterior expectations? Is it not reasonable to expect globalization to be conducted in a manner that affirms and supports principles of human rights, of democratic rule, of subsidiarity, of equality of opportunity, of environmental sustainability? Might it be possible for globalization to be practiced in a way that is more democratic, more human in scale, more permeated by widespread participation in free enterprise, and more equitable? In the recent wave of global, globalization, it seems that there has been considerable difficulty not only anticipating significant problems beforehand, but even fully noticing them after they arose. Part of the difficulty is that many of globalization's problems are experienced in developing nations, and primarily by the poor. These voices have largely been excluded from the debate about globalization. The environment, as well, has no voice of its own and has not been adequately represented. Furthermore, the, no the notion that there has occurred anything like a genuine debate about globalization in the first place is also dubious. Neoliberalism has systematically argued for unfettered markets and the minimization of political intervention in economic matters and has been remarkably influential. Under its influence, there has been cultivated an incapacity to appreciate the fact that markets are sometimes inefficient and consequently a general unwillingness to examine symptoms of market failure or proposals for reforms. The anti-globalization movement and demagogues who would exploit its aspirations for their own purposes now thrust the obvious failures of globalization forward for belated consideration. Yet nationalist withdrawal is liable to induce significant economic setback and it interjects considerable new geopolitical risks as well. Hence, it may be timely to pose the question, if the intent is for globalization to continue into the future, but on a reformed and more humanized basis, how might current failings be systematically examined and new possibilities be more comprehensively envisioned? I propose a heuristic for the critical analysis of analysis of globalization is needed, and that a theoretic foundation for this might be established on the basis of Bernard Lonergan's account in Insight of Emergent Probability. Bernard Lonergan's metaphysics sought to understand natural and human reality evolutionarily as an emerging series of distinct levels of conditions 
each making possible higher kinds of actions and interactions, and each transforming the possibilities at the, under, at the underlying levels. In the context of this account, and Lodergan's macroeconomic writings as well, economy is not presented as a conceptualistically isolated domain. While economy can and must be understood in terms of its own proper internal terms and relations, it must also be understood in relation to the extrinsic natural, technical, social, political, and cultural schemes of recurrence. Furthermore, while the subhuman level of world order, this would be the physical level, the chemical level, the botanical level, the zoological level, while these are merely intelligible, the human level is constituted by operations of intelligence by which we establish, maintain, and transform the conditions for our own living. It's the remarkable thing about human beings as we make ourselves in some sense. Human reality, including economic reality, or including economic activity, is self-constituted. It is mediated by meaning and motivated by value. Next, I differentiate um, emergent technical, economic, political, and cultural levels of self-constitution. Beginning at the bottom um, would be the emergence of the, um, the technical from, from the natural. Okay? Technology builds on what is given in nature. It's something we do to nature to, to make tools and, and build things and, and so forth. So this emergence of the technical level from the natural level. I'll be working my way up through these levels. Um, again, if you're taking, um, um, well, would it help? It might help, right? And so if I, my, if I had a chalkboard at the top, if you, if you have notes, if you're taking notes, at the top level is the cultural level here. Actually, religious levels above that. We, we're not going to talk about that. The cultural level, beneath that, the political level. Underneath that, the social economic. Underneath that, the technical. And at the, the lowest, most basic level is the natural level. Nature, technology, economy, politics, culture. Okay. So what we're doing now is working our way, working our way up from the bottom. Okay. So in his account of intelligence. Lonergan explicated common sense knowing as knowing for the sake of making and doing. Evolutionarily, it is likely to have manifested initially in tool making. Quote, at first there appears, quoting Lonergan here, at first there appears little to differentiate man from the beasts. For in primitive fruit gathering culture, hunger is linked to eating by a simple sequence of bodily movements. You just pick the tr fruit off the tree or whatever. But primitive hunters take time out from hunting to make spears. And primitive fishers take time out from fishing to make nets. Uh, first you could just grab the fruit or grab the, maybe, maybe if you're quick, grab the fish. Okay? But that taking time out to think about a more efficient way to, to catch a fish or to, to, um, to get food, make a net. Okay? or a spear, that's technology. It doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to have silicon chips to be technology. A spear is technology. Right? And so it's emerging out of the natural level, kind of from below upwards. Spear making and net making are instances of practical intelligence, indeed of technological innovation functioning in an, in an incipient context of economic capital formation. The making and subsequent using of spears and nets generates and sustains a more amenable set of living conditions. Some combination of more food, more leisure, and or more people who can be fed. Economic activity is, so, so, so that's the technical, and then building on top of that, there's an economic order that, that supervenes upon the technical. Economic activity is emergent upon the exercise of human intelligence at the technical level. And production is, in fact, an important mode of human self-constitution. By insights, creativity, and action at the technical and economic levels, 
we human beings set the material conditions under which we will live. Economic activity affects a transformation of the potentialities of nature. You're taking wood or metal or plant fibers. And this is um, transformed into a standard of living, nutritious food or commodious housing. And ongoing insights into the limitations of the productive process yield ever further technological innovations, which in turn evoke ever further expansions of capital. They have this continuous pro progress. This expansion of technological innovation and capital formation in turn sets, a co sets conditions for the emergence of new patterns of social relations. In proportion to its complexity, the expansion requires performances of a bewildering variety of specialized tasks, development, developments of skills necessary for the efficient execution of those tasks, and some manner of eliciting cooperation among all involved. As requisite patterns of cooperation must be recurrent and ongoing, capital expansion establishes an exigence for an orderly and stable framework for cooperation. Quoting Lonergan, it calls forth some economic system, some procedure that sets the balance between the production of consumer goods and new capital formation, some method that settles what quantities of goods and services are to be supplied, some device for assigning tasks to individuals, and for distributing among, among them the common product. While a functioning economic system presupposes complex routines of cooperation, the act of establishing or transforming an economic system is not itself an economic, but rather a political act. So what kind of economic system are we going to have? How is this economic order going to be? That's a political question. It's a higher, there's a higher order that sets, um, sets how the economic order will be. Quote, each step in the process of technological and economic development is an occasion on which minds differ. New insights have to be communicated. Enthusiasm has to be roused. And a common decision must, must be reached. Given this recurrent need for effective agreement, there arises a further exigence for a, a, a political specialization of common sense. Political order is emergent upon economic order. Quote, as technology evokes the economy, so the economy evokes the polity. Political orders, in turn, are themselves promoted or criticized, built up or abandoned, in light of a yet higher level of human activity, that is, in light of the apprehension of cultural meanings and values. So, Lonergan has differentiated emerging Again, but if you can think of this vertically, um, hierarchically, Lonergan has differentiated emerging natural, technical, economic, political, and cultural schemes, and clarified how these are related in the manner of a series of successive sublations. Lower levels of order set conditions of possibility for higher levels. The presence of fish and of hungry people evokes the possibility of making nets. The commencing of net making gives rise to questions about who makes the nets, and how many, and who fishes, and for who, how long, and who gets to eat the fish. These are political questions. Once an established economic system is in place, such questions will tend to be answered in a routine and seemingly self-evident manner. But economic systems are not naturally given. They arise and are transformed through the political discourse that the exigence for economic cooperation itself evoked. Economic and political events, in turn, especially, especially negative experiences of tragedy, breakdown, or conflict, can evoke a yet higher level of cultural reflection. Economic or political failure can engender reconsideration of political authority or the envisioning of a less dysfunctional, more ideal political order. Reflection in the wake of tragedy can also awaken questions of fundamental human identity, questions that can be explored freely 
only at the level of culture, through drama and dance, music and poetry, painting and sculpture, literature and philosophy. Now implicit in Lonergan's emergent conception of human reality is an understanding of the normative relation of theory to praxis. As lower levels of praxis concretely establish an exigence for higher orders of reflection, such reflection and the decisions arising from it in turn reorder the underlying praxis and generally in a progressive manner. Now working from the top down, um, Normatively, it means what should happen, cultural reflection and creativity ought to exercise a critical function with respect to deficiencies disclosed in the established political order. The political order is not ultimate. Culture has a, an inherent critical capacity to examine and reconsider the political order if it's alive and well and healthy. The political order normatively ought to enable and regulate economic activity such that it can be optimally efficient, sustainable, and just. This idea that we don't need politics, we don't need government, the economy will just be the highest level and we'll order everything to the best. This is the neoliberal fantasy and it hasn't panned out so well. The economic order, when it functions as it ought, both engages in production that makes optimal use of available technological innovations and ensures sustainable conditions of monetary circulation necessary for the long-term elevation of a community's standard of living. Technology itself is a multi-layered supervening of practical human intelligence upon the potentialities of nature. Finally, natural ecologies have a fragile reality of their own, which can be disregarded only at the risk of their and our destruction. Unfortunately, this normative conception of the relation of theory to praxis is not widely, widely understood or appreciated and is frequently subverted. Although culture possesses a de jure, possesses de jure a critical function, Political regimes have de facto perennially resisted criticism of, of their transgressions of religious, personal, cultural, political, social, and vital values. By an exercise of power, criticism can be suppressed. Yet a political order that will not open itself to culture's envisioning of higher human aspirations will rob itself of the self-awareness and motivation necessary for self-correction and improvement. It will invite decay. A political order that would attempt to domesticate culture, that would subject its poets, musicians, artists, authors, and free press to brute power, blinds itself to the values those cultural agents might otherwise have disclosed, and lowers itself into the decadent routines of tyranny. Likewise, de jure, the political order exists in part to enable and regulate economic activity. Contrary to neoliberal ideology, markets do not exist in some sort of apolitical vacuum and are not invulnerable to failure. The establishment of institutional, legal, and regulatory frameworks necessary for the existence and functioning of markets is itself a political achievement. Market inefficiencies in the production of public goods, such as affordable health care, as well as market generation of negative externalities, such as pollution and unemployment, require prudential political initiatives that implement practical insights tending toward more optimal, sustainable, and equitable economic systemization. The notion that political ordering of economic activity is unnecessary or generally counterproductive stems either from a dubious optimism regarding the invisible hand of the market or an overblown cynicism regarding the incompetence or corruption of government. Nevertheless, for nearly five decades, neoliberalism has been quite effective in convincing politicians to abdicate their responsibility for economic oversight 
and in unfettering commerce and finance from purportedly intrusive regulation and taxation. Are we still, still conscious? <laughs> um, I now attempt to uh, apply these ideas concerning emergence to, specifically to the analysis of globalization. The general thesis here is that when higher order reflection is suppressed, ignored, or met with intolerance, there tends to occur an illegitimate subordination of the higher by the lower. Insofar as higher order reflection is in fact normative, opportunities for progress are foregone and development of the common good is stunted. Vital social, cultural, personal, and religious values are undermined in subtle or dramatic ways. To the extent that the established good of order deteriorates, particular goods generated by that order also fail to materialize. In other words, good things don't, that could, ha could have happened don't happen. In short, ideology precipitates objective decline. My thesis specifically with regard to globalization is that the expansion of commerce and finance from a national to a global scale certainly complicated matters and possibly abets a deleterious subordination of the political to the economic order. Even for economies relatively closed at the national level, for instance, a, in the context of a pre-globalized minimal foreign trade context, fostering and maintaining conditions for growth, financial stability, and social justice is difficult enough. Globalization superimposes complex additional challenges and introduces a host of new vulnerabilities. Technical innovations in transportation, data processing, and communication have made possible the delocalization of capital, labor markets, and markets for con consumer and producer goods. Because capital can be shifted with ease from one region to another, transnational corporations are free to exploit the new, lo new global markets by gravitating towards those regions where profits can be maximized with minimal regulatory intervention. If local pressures are placed on a transnational concerning wages, or labor practices, or environmental regulations, or taxation, or any other form of public accountability to local stakeholders, that transnational uh, deems unpalatable, those operations can be shifted to an alternate location where the aggregate of these pressures are deemed less onerous. In, in other words, multinational corporations, if they don't like the rules of the game in any particular location, they just up and leave, and it creates this competitive environment among, um, among governments to, to be most accommodating, and it, this waters down. Um, and the concerns of local stakeholders. While the economic order is in fact distinct from the political and cultural, these three levels have tended to conflate under neoliberalism and its imperatives of a minimally regulated global economy. When local and national communities risk sudden evaporation of their economic base, should they assert their ethically legitimate stakeholder interests such communities are severely pressured for the sake of economic competitiveness to bring their political and cultural identities in, into conformity with the exigencies of the transnationals. What effectively results over time is a tragic incapacity to preserve cultural diversity and political autonomy. In the worst instances, the common good is sacrificed to what is actually an economic disorder. Prior to the unleashing, unleashing of globalization, there should have occurred extensive and systematic research, debate, and democratic deliberation centered upon understanding and evaluating globalization's anticipatable effects upon all stakeholders. If the problems and vulnerabilities that have now become apparent in the unfolding of this bold experiment are not remedied in a timely manner, globalization will increasingly and rightly be regarded as anti-progressive and dehumanizing. The anti-globalization movement, both in the developing world and now more recently, Brexit just this week, right, um, in developing nations as well, is seeking political redress to its grievances. 
under the assumption that nationalist retreat from globalization would be detrimental overall, and sharing the hope of many that globalization might be reformed, I offer the following sketch of a heuristic for the critical analysis of globalization. So the heuristic itself. Although globalization is a phenomenon driven primarily by economic interests, its ramifications are pervasive and affect every level of human reality, from the integrity of the environment to the practice of religion. Obviously, it is imperative that globalization be correctly understood and managed in its properly economic dimensions. But it must also be understood, critically analyzed, and freely deliberated upon from a perspective far more comprehensive than has been generally uh, adopted so far. A heuristic to flesh out this perspective could be based upon the theoretic foundation that we just, we just presented a cascade of higher order reflection, normatively transforming lower orders of praxis. An heuristic is a technique that facilitates understanding or discovery by methodically specifying the unknown that is, in, that is un intended. Remember the X in, in algebra, specifying an unknown that you want to know. And, uh, so the heuristic that I propose is actually quite simple. I'm not so sure about that now. Uh, <laughs> rather than basing research and policy deliberation concerning globalization upon narrow and abstract, purely economic models alone, attention is also to be directed more broadly toward what I will be calling four junctures of interaction. So I'll be uh, focusing upon the way in which these five levels meet up with one another. There's four junctures, four, four meeting places. If you look at your notes, you can draw four lines between those five words. Those are the junctures that I want to think about. So first, at the t top down here, the cultural political juncture. Second, the political economic juncture. Third, the economic technical juncture. And fourth, the technical natural juncture. Each junction is a locus of concrete events, problems, and vulnerabilities at which specific issues concerning globalization might be identified. For Lonergan, human progress fundamentally requires the asking and answering of further relevant questions. Systematic consideration of each junction would tend to generate further relevant questions, which otherwise might go unasked. The foundational theory of a normative hierarchical patterning of emergent levels in descending order, the cultural, political, economic, technical, and natural, alerts us to the possibility of illegitimate inversions, of subordination of the higher by the lower, and especially of the political by the economic. The possibility of practical reversals of these inversions or subordinations may be suggestive of viable remedies. And now I would like to briefly highlight each junction and provide some indication of the range of questions that the heuristic would, might evoke for the responsible consideration of people who care about these things. So first, focusing at this top junction where the cultural level meets the political. Okay? So first of all, what should that be? Um, globalization has undeniably disrupted pre-existing cultural and social arrangements often in ways described as destructive by those who actually underwent the changes. There occurred far too little political deliberation beforehand about the changes globalization would likely bring, far too little protection during the changes, and far too ineffective remediation afterward. Granted, the clock cannot be turned back, but how might there be better cultural and social outcomes going forward? Concretely, quoting Lonergan here, a culture is a set of meanings and values informing a common way of life. Culture is that in light of which particular political orders are established and maintained, criticized and transformed. Normatively, the political order exists to exercise guidance over the lower economic good of order and to protect higher cultural, personal, and religious rights that might otherwise be vulnerable. 
When unfettered globalization subverts the political order, however, cultural goods are sacrificed to the imperatives of a minimally regulated global economy. Consequently, this heuristic would, ins uh, would insist that globalization be critically analyzed at the cultural political juncture. So what kinds of questions at, um, might, might be kicked up when we think about specifically the role of culture, the role of politics, what that ought to be, and how it could be in inverted? If we start thinking in a way that highlights that specifically, what kinds of questions might be kicked up? And it, as it turns out, all sorts of, um, all sorts of um, pertinent questions might be kicked up. And I'll, I will I'll rattle through quite a few of these. Okay? So again, we're at the cultural political juncture. So a question that might, might come up here is how might globalization alter or weaken local, economy, or local communities? How does urbanization and the loss of rural society pose a threat to cultural identity? and potentially undermine traditional values? How is the character of local community changed by the displacement of local stores, small businesses, and restaurants by more efficient foreign competitors? Does globalization's reinforcement of the dominance of languages such as English threaten the vitality of na native languages? Under what conditions does the pace of change become too rapid to allow sufficient time for cultural adaptation. Might there be undesirable consequences to the global dominance of America, the American entertainment industry? Is it culturally healthy for trade agreements to prohibit nations from subsidizing their own domestic movie, movie industries? This is something that was in Stiglitz's book. I had no idea that this, this was um, something that was happening. What are the cultural and political dangers accompanying concentration of media power, increasing media ownership by multinational corporations and or foreign control of media? What are the adverse effect of intellectual property rights agreements with respect to issues such as the affordability of life-saving medication, uh, access to knowledge and facilitation of research, maintenance of privacy and personal data ownership? What are the perceived or actual inequities inherent in the global globalization process and how might these undermine mutual trust and social cohesion? How does globalization contribute to the problem of income and wealth inequality? What might be done to promote fairness and greater equality of opportunity? Um, and more, there's more, I'm gonna skip a few here um, so that we can move to the political economic junction well, de jure, the political order exercises legitimate guidance over the economic order. Globalization under the sway of neoliberal ideology assumes that markets are efficient and self-regulating and pressured for minimal government oversight, indeed for minimal government altogether. Insofar as markets are not in fact perfectly efficient and self-regulating, and insofar as government, weak government is detrimental for other reasons that transcend economics, <coughs> Globalization has possibly had a distortive influence and should be critically analyzed at the political economic juncture. So examples here at this juncture of questions that might be explored. How has globalization contributed to the growth and increasing power of multinational corporations? Do multinational corporations exercise power in a manner consistent with the principles of democracy, responsible citizenship, and environmental stewardship? How has globalization's framework for international mobility of capital and access to lab global labor and consumer markets enabled a race to the bottom in terms of avoiding regulations, reducing wages and worker protections, and minimizing corporate taxation? What are the consequences of market-driven demands of multinational corporations to deregulate and cut taxes under threat of moving operations elsewhere for workers, for communities, for the environment, for government's ability to provide public goods. Again, I'm going to cut, cut through a bunch of these. Um, literally, literally um, hundreds if not thousands of questions that are specifically focused at these, at these junctures. The awareness of the juncture itself. Um, allows the questions to arise. 
every question, I mean, it's hard to sit through these, but every question that I'm asking, there are potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of people suffering every day because there isn't a good answer out there now. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to go on and on, but it does go, this is the point, it does go on and on. The questions do go on and on. If, if you care and, and have um, a heuristic, a way of thinking about these things. And the, and the big takeaway point of, of the paper is these questions, these thousands and thousands of questions that ought to be asked and thought about and deliberated about and dem democratically decided upon, that they never got asked. And the world is the way that it is because things weren't understood and deliberated about and decided on. Or they were, but by a small group of people behind closed doors in smoke-filled rooms. Right? And maybe that's not the best way of, of doing things. Um, dropping down to the, the, um, the, the, the junction where technology, um, where, where, where economics meet tech, meets technology, the economic technical juncture. Long-term uh, economic progress involves successive transformations of the means of production. This process has financial and technical conditions. Uh, current consumption must be deferred to create savings, and savings must be invested intelligently to implement newly available technological innovations that improve production. Ideally, the pro process is guided by the best available insights contributed by a wide variety of participants engaged in free enterprise. Globalization, however, involves considerable concentration of financial power and complexifies production relative to how it would otherwise occur if bound nationally. Consequently, globalization should be critically analyzed at the economic technical juncture. Examples of questions that might be explored at this juncture include the following. To what extent does globalization's pressure toward maximum efficiency tend to require mega scale implementation of technology and encourage a winner take all competitive environment? Does extremely, cap does extremely capital intensive industry tend thereby to be become quasi monopolistic? If so, what are the long term consequences for consumers and workers? Ought the scale of production and the technologies employed be determined solely on the basis of prof profit maximization? Rapid trade liberalization has resulted in the destruction of, of local small businesses by larger foreign firms. Barring blanket protectionism, might there be creative solutions to foster and preserve distinctive and economically viable domestic small businesses? Given the indispensability of bank lending to small businesses and farmers in particular, should additional precautions be taken to prevent large foreign financial institutions from, from displacing smaller domestic banks? Um, it goes on and on for <laughs> cut, cut more at that juncture, right? And let's get to our final juncture, finally, the, where the technical and the natural meet. Okay, so we're getting into environmental issues here. Human economic activity affects a technical transformation of the potentialities of nature into a, a standard of living. In this process, the integrity and finite limits of natural ecologies ought to be respected. A global economy that lacks suitable regulations, technologies, and scales of production, however, contributes to profound and potentially irreversible ecological and climactic degradation. Consequently, globalization should be critically analyzed at the technical natural juncture. Examples of questions that might be explored at this juncture include, has globalization made it too easy to move production to, jurisdiction, to jurisdictions that impose only, minimally, only minimal environmental regulation? Has globalization's tendency to increase the size of multinational corporations, as well as the scale of their production, potentially increased environmental harms relative to what these otherwise would have been under a larger number of smaller and more nationally rooted firms operating at smaller scales of production? Really interesting question there. Um, uh, questions about subsidies. Um, 
Unfair subsidies are generally prohibited by global trade agreements, but if a particular government refuses to impose proportionate costs upon domestic corporations that pollute or inflict environmental damage, for example, if the U.S. withdraws from the Paris Agreement and does not charge for carbon emissions, are those corporations, in effect, unfairly receiving an implicit subsidy? Um, at the World Trade Organization, quoting Stiglitz, um, Stiglitz says this, it is the voices of trade that are heard, and little attention is often paid to the concerns about the environment. So how might global trade and investment agreements incorporate routine procedures for the inclusion of voices genuinely representing the environment? So, uh, um, no, that's a lot. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you get the idea that there are these junctures and being able to think in, in terms of these levels of, of, of human goods uh, allows us to kick up questions in, in, in a fruitful way, and it's important to do that. So the four junctures, sets of questions with each. Um, brief con concluding remarks at this point. Responsible guidance of the global economy cannot occur under the spell of narrow ideologies, or by overlooking and neglecting real problems, or in the mode of an ad hoc crisis management. The intent of the foregoing heuristic is to remedy the tragic state of affairs described by Stiglitz, that, quote, the advocates of globalization had overstated the benefits, underestimated the costs, and paid little attention to how globalization affected people, with corporations getting a disproportionate share of the benefits and ordinary citizens bearing a disproportionate share of the costs, so that, so much so that many, in some cases, a majority were worse off, end quote, of Stiglitz. Problems on the scale of the global economy may seem hopelessly complex and overwhelming. Yet Bernard Lonergan would have us recollect that human beings are for themselves, quote, the executor of the emergent probability of human affairs. Understood as concretely embedded in a world order of emergent probability, even the juggernaut of the global economy can be apprehended as a field of human self-constitution and as compatible with human liberty and responsibility. While the preservation of natural ecologies must be acknowledged as setting a lower material bound for human activity, insofar as there emerge successive supervening technical, economic, political, and cultural schemes of recurrence, quote, less and less importance attaches to the probabilities of appropriate constellation, constellations of circumstances, and more and more importance attaches to the probabilities of the occurrence of insight, communication, persuasion, agreement, and decision." End quote. The humanization of the global economy will require persons who ask and answer a broad range of questions and who have insights grasping possible schemes of recurrence, who motivate themselves and others to bring about conditions rendering alternate schemes at first possible and then probable and at last actual. If the adoption of an heuristic for the rethinking of globalization would allow this difficult process to be approached in a more methodical and comprehensive manner, this might be propitious for the emergence of a more creative, holistic, and just stewardship over the global economy going forward. Thank you for your, your patience. Some of those are big words like heuristic. Um, and there's one person in this group here today who is who understands what a heuristic is, and that's our respondent to this, and that's uh, Professor J. Michael Stebbins, the Toth Lonergan Chair in Interdisciplinary Studies. So, Michael. I think Monsignor Liddy understands what a heuristic is, too. Um, so I'd like to make my remarks brief and just uh, confine them to a few 
uh, basic points. The first is that when I read uh, Paul's paper and had a chance to kind of absorb what he was doing with that heuristic, that framework for cluing us into the kinds of questions we ought to be asking about globalization, uh, I realized that it's a pretty brilliant idea. Um, and uh, I'd like, I, I'm going to encourage him to, con to keep developing it and refining it because I think it could be used both here and in all sorts of situations that involve complex human situations where all these different patterns of activity, the different types of pattern activity intertwine. So the natural, uh, which we begin with, um, and the technological and the economic and so forth. Um, I think what his approach does is it uh, gives us the possibility of not just coming up with a laundry list of problems. And the things I've been reading about globalization in preparation for this uh, event today uh, lead me to think that that's typically what happens, that uh, you generate a list of symptoms. But I think what Professor Sainte Moore is after is a diagnosis. What's, act what's going on, and I think you, this, this analysis he provides gives a way of organizing uh, and getting to the root of the problems because they begin to be defined in terms of which aspects of human cooperation are distorting and um, driving the boat in a way they shouldn't. So uh, I, I, I really want to commend you for doing something with that aspect of Lonergan's thought in a way that I think can be made really practical. And as you say, in dealing with complicated questions, you just can't escape the fact that you have to, or complicated issues, that the analysis has to be complicated. And 45 minutes probably isn't enough time to really lay that out for, <laughs> for people. Uh, it, but it would take a really long, um, deep effort. Um, the second thing I want to say is that um, this notion of how economic concerns and economic patterns can drive political patterns. So that order, the, the stack gets inverted in certain ways and you get economics rising too high up and sort of uh, promoting itself yeah, in such a way that the political order starts being motivated by economic concerns. And I think once you get any kind of inversion like that in the hierarchy that he was talking about, uh, it distorts the whole hierarchy, or at least has that possibility. So culture gets distorted too. Um, so I'm thinking about if, if uh, political situations get driven too much by economic concerns, so we, we need this business to come build here, so we're gonna give it tax cuts. Well, that might be appropriate, but the question has to be asked, uh, you know, is it? Uh, all, we're all aware, I think, of uh, the amount of lobbying that goes on. Well, at least we're aware of some of the lobbying that goes on uh, in Congress and among politicians generally, whereas there's at least the possibility of economic concerns uh, having a disproportionate influence on political decisions. But that's supported by a culture which isn't doing its proper critical thing, by a culture that is kind of in love with money and glitz. Um, gosh, the Super Bowl celebrations, uh, you know, the Super Bowl half times are, <laughs> they're not really economic, but, but we, we, we're uh, very attracted to expensive things and um, the best of everything. Even, even these sh shows on HGTV about renovating people's houses always have the, end up with these fabulous bathrooms that, you know, Louis the, the 14th never saw the like of. Um, so I think we need to be thinking ab about higher levels, partly for this reason. Globalization is a messy thing. So nobody said, okay, today we're gonna start globalization. I mean, globalization of one kind or another has been going on for centuries, for millennia. Anytime you have an empire, uh, and we've had empires in the past, not you know, at various sizes and so forth, but 
there's a tendency to, there's that availability of uh, moving money around and, uh, and uh, exerting your influence economically across uh, a wide area and across different peoples <laughs> often. The British Empire was certainly like that, but ours is driven even harder and faster by things like the invention of the, the uh, container and the container ship where now suddenly you can move vast amounts of material uh, in these huger and huger and huger ships uh, very fast from place to place or in the communication era. I mean, it, it, hasn't, it wasn't that long ago that uh, you would send a messenger with a document if you needed somebody to look at it in, in New York City, say. Then the fax became available and everybody thought that was the bee's knees. Uh, but that just drove things faster and soon you know you have people doing email with documents attached. And then you can scan documents, right? So they're just, it gets easier and faster to communicate. Uh, so, and it's easier now for money uh, to, to cross borders and so forth. And what, what globalization tends to be is, well, what it's composed of is lots and lots of decisions. You have, you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of decision makers making millions and tens of millions of decisions that all drive this process in one way or another. And so I think we need to look not only, we need to look at culture, what's culture doing to, to put a, any kind of break on, a, on bad influences there. And you have to look even higher at the personal level because in the end, as Professor St. Amour said, this is about people having insights and people making choices to live in a way and to make to live in a way and to cause things to happen that are going to improve the world so we have to think at that level too which got me to thinking about um, universities since we're at one at the moment and that's at the level of culture um, what can a university do about this well, one of the things I think is to talk about uh, economics and about business in a way that's not distorted by the kind of thinking that we call purely economic. What purely economic thinking tends to mean is economic thinking that's driven by a desire to maximize profit. And you have it's, it's sort of uh, the default position to say that the purpose of business is to maximize profit. Lonergan would not agree with that, and, and nor would some other people, Peter Drucker and others. The purpose of business is to contribute to an economy, and the purpose of the economy is to produce a material standard of living that's decent, that's humane, that's for everybody in a community. Profit Maximizing profit is a concern that's a motive of a business person or of board members or of stock owners potentially because they know that the, that the prices are going to reflect, among other things, the, the level of profitability of a company. But that's a distortion or tends to lead you to a distorted ver view of what business is all about. So I think one way at the if we're trying to influence people, educational institutions are one of the places where you can influence people's thinking. And I think particularly a Catholic university needs to be promoting an understanding of business and of the economy that's human. And that reflects the reality of what a business actually is and does. Um, businesses go under when they fail to maximize profit. But the primary reason businesses go under is because they don't have customers, because they're not providing something people want. They're not making the kind of contribution to the standard of living that people are willing to pay for. Uh, and, and I think partly overcoming that distorted thinking and calling it out and saying, that's not pure economic thinking. That's, that's an, that's a narrowing of what economics is all about or what business is all about. That's not really, doesn't really stand the test of uh, the evidence of what businesses actually do. That whole way of talking. 
So those are the main things I wanted to talk about. I think, I think this notion of the junctures is, the junctions is great and needs to be exploited and made available to people as a tool for thinking about how to analyze different human, especially complex uh, social situations like globalization. Um, I think we need to be concerned about higher levels because the higher levels, if they're doing what they're supposed to, are critiquing what's lower. And we need our culture, and we need people trying to influence the culture. We need communities trying to influence the culture to influence politics and economics and technology. Uh, and I think as a university, I think universities are one place where that's particularly needed. And I think it's incumbent on us to get behind it, to promote, to teach about um, what's actually a more realistic understanding of business uh, than the one that's typically propagated. So I'll leave it there so we have opportunity for questions and discussion.